I'd like to wish, wish everybody a good evening tonight, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes. That meets every week at the Everett East Restaurant at 2901 West Addison Street. The College of Complexes have consists of the following form, format. Are you ready, we first honey? have a brief announcements period. We then have our speaker speaking. We then have a question and answer period where we ask that you ask a question. And then at the end, we have our infamous rebuttal period where you can sound off for a certain amount of time. Tonight's author is Jerry Harris, who wrote a book called Global Capitalism and the Crisis of Democracy. He's going to be using it. Let's welcome Mr. Jerry Harris. His book, Global Capitalism and the Crisis of Democracy. Let's give a warm round of applause to Mr. Jerry Harris. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me here tonight. Really glad to be here. Uh, I'll try to speak about uh, 40 minutes. Hopefully, uh, I won't put you all to sleep after a good meal. That's what I usually do, take a nap. But, uh, uh, and then uh, we could uh, have a discussion and uh, some debate, perhaps. So the book uh, that I'm speaking on tonight uh, came out uh, early in 2016. And uh, I think it's more relevant today than even it was uh, two years ago. You talked about the crisis of democracy. We're certainly facing that today. Now, in terms of globalization, which is really the main topic, I think it's important to get a structural economic political understanding of globalization in order to be able to understand what's going on today uh, between the Democrats and the Republicans and the social movements. Um, you know, the left had a huge anti-global or global justice social movement going in the 1990s. I'm sure many of you remember that, the Battle of Seattle and the demonstrations worldwide. And then 9-11 uh, came about and uh, all that sort of disappeared. The left, of course, started to go into anti-war uh, uh, direction. And since then, of course, the right uh, and reactionary nationalists both here and in Europe, has seized globalization as their political rallying cry. Uh, and it's pretty uh, frustrating uh, to see that. Uh, but it's natural, because globalization as a project of capitalism uh, was bound to produce opposition and that opposition was bound to split into both the left and the right. And that's what we're facing, uh, facing today. Uh, so I want to talk about how globalization is different from nation-centric capitalism. In fact, capitalism we all grew up in, looking at this crowd. I know our age, and that was the way things were when we were growing up. And then I want to talk about finance and manufacturing and then go into the politics. So that's, that's the territory I'm going to try to cover. So what do we mean by globalization versus nation-centric capitalism? Well, I think the old General Motors slogan, probably most of you remember it, what's good for GM is good for America. Remember that old slogan? And in fact, that was the orientation of national capitalists and corporate champions. Most of their assets, most of their sales, and most of their employment were in the nation of origin and where they were headquartered. Uh, and there was a large international economy, but it was mainly an export economy. Build it here, export it there, and there was competition over exports. Uh, transnational capitalism, the era that we're in today, is organized in a very different way because we have global assembly lines and cross-border financial flows that have really integrated capitalism on a global scale. Not nation to nation to nation, but just a global marketplace that's integrated. So 
there's really, I think, four distinct different ways uh, between these two eras. One, as I said, national corporations versus global corporations, transnational corporations, right? Number two, the social contract versus austerity, right? The social contract of having a good job, getting good benefits, health care, public education, home ownership, enough money to look towards retirement and get your kids into college, that whole social contract that came out of World War II uh, is pretty much being torn up and we're facing austerity and neoliberalism. So that's another major difference. Number three is a little like that, but it concentrates really on the question of labor and the working class itself. Because the working class has been reorganized on a global scale. And instead of those full-time jobs with decent benefits, we're looking at temporary work, part-time work, and what Guy Standing has called the precarious or the precarious working class. That you never have a solid relationship to a job. Some call it the gig economy, right? And that is really a global phenomenon. So the relations of production, the relationship between capital and labor has been changed in a qualitative way. Lastly, if the working class has been reorganized, well, it hasn't, therefore, the capitalist class reorganized itself. And I would argue, and the School of Global Capitalism that I'm part of argues, that yes, we've moved from a nation-centric capitalist class to a transnational capitalist class. A capitalist class that is integrating financially on a global scale. And a lot of the struggles that we see today, and we see this in the Trump rhetoric, is between the old nation-centric system trying to hold on uh, and reassert itself, to hold on to its, all its privileges and legislation and taxation and its relationships being challenged every day and every way by the rising system of globalization and these new relationships that are worldwide. And that's the field of battle. That's what's going on. So let me just describe uh, briefly uh, how the transnational capitalist class is rooted economically. I'm just going to read you sort of a list of what we look at in terms of our research and analysis and what's in the book. So uh, foreign direct investments, cross-border mergers and acquisitions, foreign affiliates, global value chains, cross-border financial flows, foreign investments from sovereign Gulf funds like in China, uh, transnational stock ownership, the ratio of assets, sales, and employment nationally to what it is internationally. UN does great work on that. Um, percent of uh, well, network relationships and elite corporations, political associations, uh, like think tanks internationally, transnationalization of corporate boards, and a network of global cities. All those things really are the roots and a soil that the transnational capitalist class is rooted in and lives within. So, in terms of some stats, there are about 350,000 people worldwide that have 20 million to over a billion dollars of invest of, of capital that they can invest. About 350,000. Of course, there's a great difference between having 20 million and 1 billion. So when you get up there to the 800 million and 900 million and 1 billion and beyond, you're really talking about the elite who make a lot of the decisions, but overall that's the investment uh, class that we're looking at, about 350,000 people worldwide at this point. Uh, and so where does their head live? Where do they live on a daily basis when we're talking about these types of investments? If you're an American 
millionaire or billionaire, or if you're a Chinese billionaire, or if you're a Brazilian billionaire, are you just looking at China to invest your money, or just looking at Brazil to invest your money? Of course not. You're looking at the entire world to invest your money. And when you're looking at the entire world, you're looking at taxes, the legislation, you're looking at labor, you're looking at environmental laws, you're looking at markets, you're looking at subcontractors. That's what they're looking at every day. That's the world they're living in, right? So that's what their thinking is locked into, a global view of global markets and where to invest, where to make money, how to exploit labor globally. Now, let's think about this in terms of uh, finance capital, because that's really the heart of the system. Uh, banks, hedge funds, insurance corporations, uh, et cetera. Looking at this crowd, let me ask you, how many of you have uh, you know, retirement funds or a 401k? And when you're looking, trying to decide where to invest in that 401k, or after you retired and you sat down with some guy at the bank who was going to help you invest what money you had, how many of you were presented with all sorts of different financial tools or products, as they say, that you could invest in, right? I mean, there's this, there's that, we can put your money here, we can put your money there, but that's what these financial institutions have been doing for the last 30 years, is creating hundreds and hundreds of different products for which we can invest our money. But the main people who invest their money in these things are that transnational capitalist class. So we have to understand that financial institutions are organizing centers for the transnational capitalist class. In other words, trillions of dollars come into these financial centers. Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, BlackRock, Barclays, Deutsche Bank, in banks in Paris, banks in Frankfurt, in China, and all that money is centralized in a handful of very powerful financial institutions. And those institutions organize that money into various funds, and they send that money out into the world, into investments all over the world. And the deal is, is that they're going to profit off the labor of working men, men and women worldwide, and those profits come back to those financial institutions, and then they go out to their investors, right? That's the great circulation of capital on a global scale. And so when these millionaires and billionaires are looking at what to invest in, they're looking at everything. Uh, BlackRock, which is the largest financial institution in the world, by the way, uh, got a Greek press. invest, uh, Greek they, they press. control about five trillion dollars, just, just in BlackRock. Although it's hard to get your mind around a trillion dollars. Let me go into that for a second. It's a lot. So, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. So, uh, a Swiss research institution looked at about three million corporations. And what they found is that there are about 15 and a half thousand transnational corporations that dominate the world economy. 15 and a half thousand. And within that, they found about, I think, let me, yeah, 48,000 major stock investors from 190 countries, right? So, 15 and a half thousand transnationals. 48,000 investors from 190 countries. That's the transnational capitalist class. So, so that's what we're looking at. Um, technology has been the, the key that has opened this door. This type of organization of capital would have been impossible without the revolution in information communications technologies, ICT. Now, why is that? Because you need the speed to create a real-life economy in real time to organize that and command that on a global scale. Impossible with the telephone lines of the 1950s. Now, when they first laid 
the telephone lines between Europe and the United States in the early 1950s. You know how many calls that could handle? Yeah, it was, well, it was about 120 or 150 at one time. Four per strand. Four per strand. Thank you. So think about that compared to the Internet today. Now, let me give you an example of how these... Uh, financial markets work before we go on to manufacturing. Let's look at the money markets. Anyone invested in money markets, by the way? Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, me too. So money markets are one of the largest markets in the world. The money markets do $5 trillion a day in trades and buys. Now, we've been talking about a trillion. Let's get our mind around that. So one million, one million is something we can understand because one million seconds is 12 and a half days. Let me repeat it. One million seconds, 12 and a half days. What is one trillion seconds? Let me, let me throw out a couple guesstimates. Let me take two or three. Just what do you think off the top of your head? You said. An hour, hour and a half. Well, we said a million was 12 and a half days, so a trillion. And a trillion is a million million. So it was more than an hour and a half. Well, how many days divided by a million? Okay. Well, then, you, sir, you give me an estimate. Five billion years. Five billion years. Wow, that's the biggest estimate I ever got. How about that? I saw a hand over there. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd estimate that to be something like God. Uh, about a year. A year. So we got a billion over here, five billion over here, and we got one year over here. That's a hell of a, yeah, a, hell of a spread. <clears throat> well, what it is is 36,000 years. So one million, 12 and a half days, one trillion, you were sort of close, 36,000 years. And we're talking about the money markets that do five trillion every day. That's what that's that's the account. Now, how do you move that much money around? ICT, Information Communication Technologies, and there's a huge computer, Swift computer, in New Jersey, one in Belgium, and a couple other countries that process these trades in nanoseconds. Right? They're they're moving in a millionth or a trillionth of a second. That's how fast they are, and most of them are operating by algorithms. So. 70% of trades, not only in the money market, but 70% of all trades are traded now by algorithms, not humans making trades on the telephones or yelling in the stock market like we used to do here at the Chicago Stock Exchange. Now, algorithms are written by actually a handful of PhD mathematicians. Then they get a team of 150 or 200 to write out the code. But once that code is written, and it's based, of course, on mathematics, looking for certain formulas, looking for certain relationships, looking for certain words, because they read words and read journals. Uh, and once that's put into the computer, and the orders are put in, there's, there's no person working that. It's like the matrix. It's computers looking at computers at a global scale and making trades like faster than that, much faster than that. So in the money markets, they're looking for arbitrage, right? So arbitrage is the difference in price that exists in the same moment in time. And usually, we're only looking at maybe one-tenth of one penny difference in the price of money. So let's say you have dollars and you want to buy euros. So your algorithm is looking at the price of euros in Frankfurt and it's looking at the price of euros in Tokyo, and looking at the price of euros in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, and maybe the price of euros in Japan is one-tenth of a penny lower than the price of euros in Frankfurt. So what does your algorithm do? You put in an order for 200 million euros and you're going to buy it in Japan. One-tenth of a cent lower than Frankfurt. And immediately, you're going to put those euros back for sale in Frankfurt. And you're going to make on 200 million, 
about two million in that trade. But that trade may happen within one or two seconds. It may at the most happen in a few minutes. The average trade takes about 20 seconds. And that's what you're going to do. That's what your algorithm does all day long to $5 trillion every damn day. So that's, that's the type of economy we're looking at here. Uh, and that's how these guys are getting so damn rich. Uh, Mr. What's his name? Griffin, the guy who owns capital investments here in downtown? Yes, Ken Griffin. Ken Griffin gave 250000 to Rauner and 50000 to Mayor Ron. So two years ago, he made $800 million in income in one year. $800 million. That was the year that Chicago was having a budget crisis where we were $600 million short. So this guy could have given the city of Chicago 600 million and still had 200 million, not in his total wealth, just 200 million for one year. Well, obviously, I would think it's immoral, crazy, and even criminal to let this type of economy exist. But this is the economy that globalization and transnational capitalist classes brought us. So let's turn now to manufacturing for a bit that we talked about uh, finance. Um, actually, finance and manufacturing are tied together very closely because almost every major manufacturing company in the world is, is on stocks, so they're stock ownership. Now, the thing to understand about these corporations is that when you look at the stock ownership, I don't care what the name of the country is, company is, if you look at the stock ownership, you're going to find international investors from all around the world. You're thinking you're looking at an American corporation? Hell no. If you're looking at a transnational corporation, about 45% of all stock is owned outside of the country. Right? So America has about five and a half trillion invested abroad, and there's about six trillion invested in America. You know, it's just, it's integrated like this, including, by the way, sovereign wealth funds from China and Singapore and Dubai and those countries, which are state funds, right? Uh, they're integrated also. So when you look at GM, or you look at, well, I'll give you a couple examples here in a second. When we think about this type of economy, we have to think about a global assembly line, right? So when you think about a product being produced, you got to think about that product being produced in a dozen countries by hundreds of subcontractors. So take Apple's iPhone. So Apple has hundreds and hundreds of subcontractors. And in fact, subcontractors subcontract with other subcontractors. Uh, so you're having parts made in South Korea, in the Czech Republic, in Brazil, in Singapore, et cetera, et cetera. And all those parts that are sent to China, to Foxconn, which is a Taiwanese corporation employing a million people in China. It's assembled in China, and then it's shipped here to the United States, right? So when we talk about exports, and Donald Trump has made a big thing about unfair trade with China, et cetera, et cetera. What the hell are we really talking about? Because the majority of exports today are intra-firm trading. In other words, all that stuff I just described for Apple, that's Apple exporting to Apple. It's not uh, the Czech Republic exporting to China and China exporting to America. It's Apple exporting to Apple. 80% of Walmart's products come from China. Is China exporting to America or is Walmart simply exporting to itself? Right? That's how you have to think of the export. Huh? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so when Trump talks about make America great again, 
He's appealing to sort of a historically privileged nation-centric working class, but labor is not organized like that anymore. The world is not organized like that anymore. So he's making this populist appeal that has no relationship to how the world really works. But of course, it's the world that people have grown up in. It's the world that, the way that people think the world still works, nation to nation competition. And so it makes sense. The appeal makes sense. They go out and vote for Trump. Um, the other two things about this uh, sort of manufacturing is it's not all exports and imports. Corporations go abroad so they can be in those markets. Why do companies mainly go to China? So they can produce in China and sell in China. Why do you go to Brazil? Well, yeah, there's cheap labor, but you want to get access to the Brazilian market. Just like <laughs> Honda and Toyota came to America to access the American market, yeah. right? So that's, that's the other part of the story. And that's why a lot of these jobs are not coming back. Yeah? How does taxes fit in any question? Can you moderate? Uh, I just, just don't know if that. Yeah. You're going to talk about that. Uh, let me, I will get to tax havens in particular and some, some questions about that. Thank you. So, um, let me, give, let me give one last example uh, here on the manufacturing stuff. Um, so, as I've laid it out, you really have to think about it as monopoly to monopoly competition, not nation to nation competition. Let me give you an example of General Electric and Siemens. Is that competition between Germany and the United States? Siemens, the great national champion of Germany, GE, the great national champion of American manufacturing? Well, both Siemens and GE have more assets, more employment, and more sales outside their national borders than inside their national borders. And in fact, Siemens is active in every state of the United States in terms of manufacturing and sales. Siemens exports four billion dollars worth of commodities from the United States to the world markets. So if Siemens as a German corporation trying to defeat American capitalism, that's insane. It's part of American capitalism like GE is part of European capitalism. They want a strong American economy. They pay good wages. They export from here. Right? They're part of the American economy. And if you look at the stock ownership of GE and Siemens, you're going to find people investing from China, from Nigeria, from Brazil, from France, from Sweden, from the UK, from the United States, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we have to get our heads around. Stop thinking just in terms of nation-centric competition. So let me progress to the role of government and the state. And um, this is a complex process because, like I said in the beginning, there's a constant conflict between the old economy and the new. And of course, we see that in the political rhetoric of Trump. Um, our government's still important. Some people who look at globalization have talked about, well, governments don't matter anymore because the economy goes on on a global level and governments have been depowered. Uh, I disagree with that. I think states and governments are very important. The question is, how is the capitalist class using government? Not that governments are unimportant. And as we've moved from a nation-centric capitalist class to a transnational capitalist class, local governments national governments in the U.S. or in the EU or in China have been re-engineered to, to construct uh, legislation, taxes, subsidies, to house, to empower, and to expand the global economy. In fact, who did that best? Bill and Hillary Clinton with Rubin, and Summers at the Treasury. They're the ones who rewrote the Glass-Siegel Act. They're the ones who got NAFTA 
that when people were being beat in the streets of Seattle, beat, Bill Clinton went to the WTO and gave a speech. Globalization is great. So states are still important. But another thing has developed, which is transnational governance. In the face of the World Trade Organization, the IMF, the World Bank, the G7, the G20, all of these institutions are above any democratic control. We don't vote in any way for representation in these bodies, but they do make global trade agreements, global legislation, global courts that where corporations can sue countries, etc. So that is also happening, sort of a, a beginning of a global state, if you would. Not totally consolidated, but you can see it. Um, so let's, uh, yes, about taxes. One interesting thing about taxes are tax havens. So um, uh, one of the major research institutions in the world, McKinsey Institute, has said there's, they think there's about $21 trillion in tax havens around the world. And there's about 70 or 75 tax havens. One of the famous is, of course, the Cayman Islands, where there's more corporate headquarters than there are people who live on the island. <laughs> right, so you go into a building and there's lots of doors with brass plates on the doors, you know, a few chairs and a table on inside the door, and that's the corporate headquarters. <laughs> right? And so there's a tremendous amount, and also private wealth, of course, is being hidden in all these tax havens, too. So here we have sort of the scene of where the capitalist class no longer wants to pay taxes to support their own state. I mean, one thing about the old nation-centric capitalist class is that, yeah, they believe that they have to have a state to protect themselves, an army, legislation around them, all that. And they would at least pay part of the tax bill for that. Transnational capital class says to hell with that. We're just going to avoid paying taxes whatsoever. We're going to keep our money in uh, tax havens or go to places like the Netherlands and Ireland where we can pay 4 or 5% on taxes. And screw you, United States. We're not headquartered, but well, we may be headquartered in you, but our profits are over here. Right? So that's another aspect of this transnational consciousness. Um, let me give you two last examples here on uh, sort of the, the role of the government. So remember the big bailout that Obama did of General Motors and Chrysler? And I, yeah, and Wall Street, those two. So I'm glad he bailed out the auto corporations, but it was portrayed as saving American champions. But if you do a little reading and research, um, GM, minutes, sir, we'll busy, yeah. GM was saved by shrinking its footprint in America and expanding its footprint worldwide. It has less warehouses, less employment, less factories in America now with the bailout that it did before. And what about Chrysler? Well, Chrysler was saved by turning it into an Italian corporation. Fiat owns Chrysler. That was the deal. And they got it for actually virtually nothing. So are we saving American champions or simply transnational corporations are being saved here? In fact, you know, Chrysler's slogan is a perfect example of how globalization has taken over. How many of you have heard that great commercial from Chrysler imported from Detroit? <laughs> imported from, well they are because it's an Italian car. Now, so it is imported from Detroit. Compare that to GM. What's good for GM is good for America. Those two advertising slogans sort of represent these two different eras in capitalism. So the last example, and you mentioned, well, what about Wall Street? So there was about a $1.2 trillion bailout of Wall Street. We remember that. But Half of that money that went to bail out banks went to foreign banks that operate in America. Uh, the, uh, Royal, uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland 
uh, got $84.5 billion bailout. UBS got a $77 billion bailout. Those two foreign banks were the top five banks that got bailed out. So the government or the state is still important, but how does it operate? It operates to protect and expand transnational capital rather than nation-centric capital. So if we turn to um, the politics of today, we can understand how much anger is out there, right? I mean, we know what people are responding to. But one of the great differences between left global justice movement and the Trump anti-global movement is that the Trump movement is based on reactionary nationalism, anti-immigration and racism, and the global left is based on internationalism and anti-racism. And here, you know, I was in a Prague in Europe for four months uh, with a guest professorship where I wrote about a half or so of the book. Uh, and, you know, the anti-immigration movement was just, uh, it was, uh, and, the, and the immigration crisis was just on the news every night, headlined the whole time we were there. And it was obvious that it was creating huge political divisions in Europe. So it was no surprise to me to see Trump jump all over this from his reactionary mindset and make tremendous uh, advances in terms of his popularity because of it. And I think uh, that's key because when you compare Sanders and Trump, I mean, what was the great difference? Both of them talked about jobs. Both of them talked about globalization. Uh, so what would make you vote for Trump rather than Bernie? Well anti-immigration stuff and the racist stuff and the sexist stuff. I mean, that was the great dividing line between their two campaigns. So what attracted to you to one campaign or the other? I mean, you have to think about that. Uh, when you look at immigration, you know, I was looking at this uh, foreign policy. This is from early 2000. They had an interesting graph on immigration. From, uh, and here's 1960. <laughs> The top five countries in terms of immigration, Poland, the UK, Canada, Germany, and Italy. That's 1960. 2000, the five countries with the greatest immigration to America, Cuba, India, Philippines, China, and Mexico. Now what's the big difference between these two, right? One are people from the global south, and the other people are from white Europe, right? And does that relate to the anti-immigration movement today? It's staring you in the face, right? I mean, it's, it's not, there's no question about it. Um, so, let me just uh, go to my last notes here. I'm trying to keep, keep my time down so we can have a good discussion. Um, I think there's a historic disconnect, it's one of the great problems today, between how far globalization advanced economically and the difficulty of creating a governmental structure around that. Why is that? It's because in government, they have a very difficult task. They have to maintain legi legitimacy for the system. And so they're open to being pressured from below. So, you know, Exxon Mobil and GE and Deutsche Bank and, and all these corporations, they're distance from popular rebellion. They get affected by it somewhat, but mainly that's directed at government. So government politicians have the task of trying to cool out and maintain legitimacy for the system. And that's one of the great disconnects of the political realm, because all these contradictions are bubbling up from the left and from the right, and they're affecting the transnational capitalist class control of government and the state. And unfortunately, of course, in the United States, we've seen the right take power. In some countries, like in Portugal, and in Latin America, and Venezuela, and Ecuador, and Bolivia, we saw left populism come to the fore. So that's still being fought out 
uh, throughout the world. What was Clinton's problem in the election that we just went through? Well, if you listen to the center and the center right of the Democratic Party, and Clinton herself, who gave a talk, what, just two nights ago, she lost because of the Russians and because of the Comley and the FBI. Right? And that's how they understand it. They refuse to recognize and deal with 35 years of loyalty to neoliberalism and globalization. That's why Hillary lost because of a 35-year history of the Democratic Party being the left foot of globalization. Yeah, there's certain tactical differences between them and the Republicans, absolutely. A pro sort of neo-Kensian versus a neoliberal wing. But they're both globalists. And so why couldn't Hillary condemn globalization and <coughs> condemn Wall Street with the same language that Bernie and Trump were able to do? Because she, she's been supporting it for 35 damn years. She was the senator from New York. Who, for God's sake, if you're the senator from New York, who do you represent but Wall, Wall Street. Street? That's why she made millions giving talks to Wall Street. So she couldn't produce the type of anger and rhetoric that was coming from Trump. She simply could not match it. And unless the left, uh, and leaders like Bernie uh, Sanders and uh, Elizabeth Warren can take leadership of the Democratic Party. Uh, it's going to go down the road that it's been going down for the last 35 years. They're going to say the Russians were the cause, the FBI screwed us over, and they'll be blinded to anything else. So I think for the progressive community in the United States, that we have to keep our eyes sharp and our voices loud in terms of talking about neoliberalism, austerity, and globalization from a left point of view. But we have to understand that globalization, how deep and powerful it is, it's just not a policy. It's just not a policy. Some politicians, George Bush and Clinton and George W. came in and Thatcher and Reagan and they, no, it's a, it's a ideology. It's the ideology of the ruling class. It's the ideology of the transnational capitalist class. That's why it's so deep and hangs on so powerfully. Uh, and as a policy hegemony, there's a neoliberal policy hegemony in the Democratic Party, in the Republican Party, and in Europe among the conservatives and the social democrats too. It's a consensus throughout that entire ruling class. And that's why it's so deep. That's why they, when Greece, look how they treated Greece and still are treating Greece uh, today. Uh, it's so deep they can't let go of their neoliberalism. They're convinced that's the way of the world. That's how dogmatic ideology functions. On the left we saw in Stalinism, right? You couldn't let, some of the left couldn't let go of Stalinism internationally. That was their view of the world, and they went to their graves believing in it. It's the same dogmatism with the neoliberals. It's the same narrow dogmatism. So there was room for Trump and his nationalist rhetoric to come in. Uh, and now the struggle is going on. And within the Trump administration, you can see both the reactionary nationalists like Bannon fighting with the more globalist wing, probably represented more by his son-in-law and the people who are at Treasury and the people who are on the Economic Council. They all come from Goldman Sachs. They all come from, uh, you know, uh, transnational capitalist institutions. So that's a struggle within the Trump administration itself. Um, one part in the book that I go into, and I wasn't able to uh, talk tonight because really it would be a whole separate presentation is the environmental crisis. Um, yeah. uh, and that's another huge crisis is staring them in the face and they have no long-term solution. There is a significant sector of the capitalist class that has moved to green capitalism, has moved to solar power, wind power, sustainable energy, because they see it as the great new market of the future. That's how they understand it. This is where the, this is how we can rejuvenate capitalism, have another round of accumulation. 
Another great technological revolution like ICT was in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. So, and that's interesting across board. So, uh, Ruben uh, Paulson from Treasury Secretary under George W. from Goldman Sachs. Uh, Bloomberg, of course, from uh, New York. Uh, others from the Democratic Party uh, stable. They all promote green capitalism. If you really study it, and, and they all have market solutions, it's going to be too little too late. Uh, you know, no matter, they're moving too slow, there's too much we know. God, look what Trump is doing on <laughs> the environment. <laughs> it is so primitive, it's so primitive that the Chinese are seizing leadership over the uh, green uh, uh, transformation. Yep. Uh, their solar power industry, their wind power industry went from virtually nothing to number one in the world within five years. They understand where the technology is going and they, they're, 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 they want to lead on it. But if we look at these corporations, the, all the solar and wind power corporations are already transnationalized with international investors too. So that, that's already happening. Uh, for us, myself, I'm a socialist. I believe in an eco-socialist future. Uh, and I, I believe that we have to start putting out the ideas of a cooperative economy. Obviously, a state-centric socialism of the 20th century largely failed. It's not with us anymore, so we know it's failed. We know that capitalism is good for the 1%, or maybe the 10%, but not very good for everybody else. So, where do we move? How do you bring democracy down to the very base? And here I'll make some ending remarks. I think we have to move beyond Republican democracy. I don't mean the Republican Party, I mean the Republican form of government that came out of the French and the American Revolution, which were great advances at the time. But it's a representative Republican democracy is you vote every four years for a prime minister or a president, and you know, that, that's mainly it. What we need is a participatory democracy, or what in Venezuela they call a protagonistic democracy. And how do you really accomplish that? You have to bring economic control down to people's, where they live and where they work. And the only way you can do that is through cooperative ownership. Uh, and there's all sorts of forms of cooperative ownership. Uh, some work well, some have problems. There's a lot of debate within that community. Uh, but I think it's really the only way forward in terms of talking about democratizing the economy. Uh, and my last chapter in the book goes into these concepts and looks at some of the major thinkers, I think, in the world today, like Marta Honecker from Chile, uh, who talk about these ideas in some depth, in some sophistication. So uh, let me uh, bring it to a halt now uh, and open it up for questions and debate. Yes. All right. First question. I have a. Uh, sorry, a question. Okay. Okay. I have a question. Uh, about, uh, I have a question about foreign affairs and war and globalization. Yes. And also, when you're done with that, uh, about your last comments, uh, cooperative uh, democracy and all that, you could talk about um, e uh, <coughs> socialist economic, but ha having a uh, socialist economics kind of thing. Um, David. Oh, so yeah, that, was, that was the question. Yeah. The uh, question of the military, I've written on that, particularly during the Iraq War. I did a lot of reading of uh, military think tanks, of which is a, you know they have a very sophisticated intellectual base. The military industrial complex. These are not a bunch of uh, red-blooded, thick-headed uh, warriors who uh, just want to go to war. There are defense universities in every uh, sector of the military. Uh, they train their people well. I've looked at the curriculum at their schools. There's a lot of debate. The debate is bordered by how to use U.S. power in the world, but within that, there's a lot of differences between globalists and super patriots and 
uh, soft power versus hard power. So don't as, as, underestimate the intellectual sophistication of the military industrial complex. Um, I think the culture of nation-centric ideology is very strong still within the military because of their particular role of expanding and defending imperialism. Uh, so uh, things don't change evenly in these different networks of power, economic power, military power, state power. You want to take care of So I got you. So the question of military power and how to use it is is a, a complex one, and you see all sorts of, as I said, debates within within that. And you can see that between the differences of Obama <coughs> and um, Trump already. The other one is she well, well, you know, just market socialism. Just talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think uh, I like. I don't know if you're familiar with David Schweiker. He's uh, from Loyola University. You should have David come and speak to you all. He's really a one of the major recognized market socialist theorists. Um, I think, uh, and I go into his argument in the book, look, markets, the state, and civil society, those three institutions are historically developed in, in terms of human civilization. And you can't just arbitrarily say you're not going to use one. So Soviet socialism, Chinese socialism said we're not going to use the market. Boom, they had serious problems. Neoliberal capitalism says to hell with the, essentially civil society and the state. We want the market to occupy the major uh, sectors of our civilization. The anarchists say to hell with both the state and the market. We just want civil society to do everything. I think all those approaches are wrong using historical materialism, if you look at the development of human civilization and why we've developed these institutions, civil society, the market, and the state, they all have a role to play. The exact relationship between the three is historically determined, culturally determined, and determined by the situation in every country. And it changes dialectically. It's dynamic, it's not static. So that's where I take off in the book. And if you read David Schweiker's uh, After Capitalism, you'll, I think you'll enjoy it if you really have questions. No, Tim, I okay. Oh. I'd like to know okay. a little bit more about what inspired you to write this book and just a little bit of the writing process and then a little bit of biographical background. Okay. Um, well, I've written a lot for journals. Uh, and. Um, so I thought instead of just writing journal articles, I should put together a book. Cheesecake is a dollar more. Uh, the, uh, you want apple pie? What I've mentioned about the screw of global capitalism. Around the year 1998-2000, uh, myself, Leslie Sklar at the London School of Economics, and Bill Robinson at UC uh, Santa Barbara, started to write about this idea of a transnational capitalist class which was hotly contested and debated at the time, and still is. Um, but over the last 15 or 16 years, a lot of people have started to pick up on the idea, do research on the idea, and we've had a number of international conferences in Prague, in Australia, and we're planning one this year in Cuba. So I wanted to uh, write a book to further propagate this analysis, and my process of writing is uh, as I read every day, between one to four hours, um, and I don't read a lot of left material. I do read left material, but mainly I'm looking at the business press and the New York Times, Financial Times. Uh, I take out articles that have data. I highlight the data and throw them in an electronic file. And I organize my electronic files. Labor, transnational capitalism, China, the environment. So when I went to write the book, I went into my files, looked at what I had saved, went through that, took out what I thought was important, boom, wrote the chapter. What's your book name? My book name is <laughs> Global Capitalism <laughs> you forgot and the Crisis of Democracy. That's and I have copies here for sale. It's usually uh, for 25 bucks uh, 
plus taxes, but I can sell it to you for twenty. Autograph copy. Absolutely. Like it? Are you based in Chicago? Yeah, yeah. I, I've lived here for a long time. Uh, uh, can you speak louder, please? Uh, uh, salvation for us. So the question was the bricks: Brazil, Russia, uh, and China. In India, China. Uh, actually, the biggest chapter in my book is on China, the longest one. Yeah. Uh, I've done a lot of work on China, and I've written about the BRICS. I think uh, what you've seen in the BRICS is the development of a uh, transnational capitalist class. Uh, now, these countries historically have contradictions with uh, uh, Europe, United States, Japan, the developed imperialist countries. And so they're fighting for their space, their spot, their equality within the project, within capitalism. So the project is similar. The project is to create a global system of manufacturing, finance, and governance. But how to do that, how to construct that project, there's a lot of conflict in that because of these historic differences and different concepts of how to do that. So, there's both a, a progressive aspect to the BRICS because historically it's rebalancing world power from oppressed countries that have been oppressed by colonialism and imperialism. But on the other hand, they're not uh, really developing the type of socialism they're really developing. Now, now some of my best friends will defend China as market socialism. Uh, and. Uh, Maybe it's a question, is the glass half full or half empty when you look at China in terms of their direction? I say, you know, so I would just say read the chapter and then uh, give me a call and we can talk about it. Okay. <laughs> this gentleman right here. You. Yeah. Um, you're talking about, uh, you mentioned that you're a socialist and uh, globalization. You've, you've not intersected uh, um, labor into this uh, uh, into this discussion you know uh, I, I could be wrong you know but I thought that uh, at a certain point in the 70s you know US labor especially the automobile industry they, they exported their philosophy into countries like Japan and South Korea and taught the working class there you know to organize into labor and they l learned learned well you know so they they took their manufacturing facilities, okay. brought them into the U.S. without la without union, without unions. Well, I did. Uh, let me just repeat a little bit and go on to your questions. Globalization has re-engineered uh, the relationship between capital and labor. There's a new relations of production in terms of Marxist terminology that's different from the nation-centric and it's based in the part-time temporary, the precarious, precarious jobs, uh, and the destruction of the social contract, and the destruction of unions. Now, in terms of your comments, I actually have it backward. You know, uh, the Japan just-in-time processing came to America. The Toyota example was adopted by the Americans. That's how it came this way. But, um, into, uh, into non-labor facilities. Into non-labor facilities. So, that's part of globalization. Where did most have, if you look today, Toyota, Honda, and the Koreans have as big a footprint in America as Ford and GM and Chrysler. It's almost equal. So, our, and the Chinese do this too. They demand corporations come to China, located in China. So, they went mainly to the south, and they're still going to the south, where they can get non-union labor. So what happened to union labor in Detroit and Michigan and Ohio went down, right? So there was a pressing down to sort of global uh, standards of labor exploitation. Rather than bringing workers in the South up, that global uh, production in the U.S. South brought the traditional nation-centric nation working class social contract down. It helped tear it up. So it was part of this process. The last thing is that you're totally right that as production went to South Korea and went to China and went to other countries like Brazil, you saw the rise of the, a new working class movements. And really, the heart of the trade unionism today is certainly not in the United States. 
It's in South Korea. It's in the new working class movements in China. It's in the South because that's where so much manufacturing is taking place today. Lady right in the back. Thank you. I just came from the Illinois Resistance Movement. We have 57 NGOs. There's a whole new university, to your point, worked with Warren's campaign that's following forward on this. I'm going to state this and let's see what your thoughts are. Have you done any focus groups in people under the age of 40? They're currently accounting for 87% of the complaints to ZC currently, and they're very, very active. Frankly, it's hard for me who's organized for years to be cautiously optimistic, but I'm very optimistic. This age range is a little bit you know, beyond that, but I'm just wondering, yeah. have you tested sure. this concern and lack of optimism in those under 40? Yes, absolutely. I, I, was, I taught at DeVry, right around the corner, for 20 years. I, yeah, it's been a little, I mean, I worked in factories for about 15 years, oil refineries in Long Beach, California, tobacco factory down in Louisville, U.S. Steel before it closed here on the south side. And when U.S. Steel closed, I went back to school, got my master's in teaching, started to teach at DeVry for 20 years. Uh, and DeVry is a good Chicago working class school, multiracial, a lot of first generation, uh, kids go there. Uh, and all these ideas I've talked about today, I talked about in the class. And uh, that's one thing that gave me a lot of hope because particularly when I talked about the cooperative economy and sort of that type of socialism, they all responded. I would ask, well, how many of you, after we would do some reading on Mondragon in Spain, which is the largest cooperative in the world, 80,000 workers, uh, and I would ask them, how many of you would like to work in a worker-owned corporation, or how many of you would like to work in a corporation where you have a boss? 95% of the class, semester after semester, would go for the cooperative. Of course. And the ones who didn't either saw themselves as becoming a boss, or they just did not want to be bothered by thinking about organizing production and all. They just wanted to go to work, screw it, and go home. Which is a reasonable attitude under capitalism. So, in many ways, the content of my book was refined uh, and developed by a good number of years of discussing it with hundreds and hundreds of students and testing the ideas out with those, with those young adults. Way the back. Uh, that was a very good presentation, probably the best presentation we've ever had on that kind of nonsense here. Hey, is this going to be in the Chicago Public Library? Uh, I don't think so. I, Should be. I, I, buy the I book. I go ask them to buy a copy. Buy, Here, buy, a, buy the question. book. Here, here's my question. Um, Donate a book to the library. Why are we taxing these rascals that have money in the Cayman Islands, the Bermudas, the Bahamas? So why is not that happening, taxing these rascals that are hiding income, revenue, and assets? One. And then two, why aren't we... Uh, taxing these rascals that do a trillion, trillion uh, um, transactions on Wall Street a minute that are making funny money that doesn't help anybody except uh, yeah. Didn't Bernie talk about that? Yes, well, yeah. even Obama talked about it the first time around. Well, he's a good talker, Obama. <laughs> Obama <laughs> talked about taxing the money in the Caymans. So yeah, sure. what's down, going on? Then it disappeared. And even Trump talked about that. Yeah. Well, I think one of the, and there, there is stuff particularly in the EU being debated over this, but I think it, it points to the power of the transnational capitalist class and their influence in government through uh, lobbyists. Uh, you can talk about it, but it's not going to get past Congress. Uh, Why not? Because of the power of the, of the capitalist class within the government. Their influence, uh, their financing of both Democrats and Republicans. Now, there are progressive Democrats who have tried to move this issue forward, uh, but it gets shut down. And I've uh, suggested uh, to uh, one of the representatives here from Evanston, who serves down in Springfield, I said, look, let's make a tax on uh, the South Street. No, Wall Street. Well, no, this, this, is, this is state government. Yeah. What the hell with state? Go national. Well, uh, go both ways. It's, it's great. Okay, but good. since I happen to know a state rep person, I said, let's do this. 
but her position was it's, it was dead on arrival, and I have other important things I'm working on in healthcare uh, that I'm really dedicated to, and that's what I need to focus on because if I start to focus on this, I know it w it won't fly. Uh, in Europe, they have it's called the Tobin tax. It was an economist 30 years ago who said taxes stuff at one tenth of one cent. That's all, and because it's trillions of dollars, yeah. it would produce billions in tax. So in Europe, they they are very close to actually passing this type of tax, but there's some countries who support it and some countries who don't. So they're trying to get it through the e e Parliament, uh, and uh, it's been slowed down. There's been a lot of roadblocks to it. Every six months, it takes another half a step forward. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's an obvious idea, right? I mean, it's well, obvious. It's the hugest money in the world. It's, it's all like the that. money in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what is the future for um, nations that have not gone through the Industrial Revolution? We're in the midst of a famine in uh, Yemen, um, South Sudan, uh, Somalia, and Nigeria. Well, I mean, I think it's pretty grim, the uh, future in a lot of countries. Because um, I, I don't see any easy answer. In the Sudan, I mean, I'm not really deeply familiar with Sudan and some of those countries, but I don't see any particularly progressive or revolutionary force uh, within uh, southern Sudan. Now, if you look at Syria, the only group that I, I think looks really progressive and revolutionary are the, the, the Kurdish uh, defense forces. They come out of a no longer a Marxist Leninist, but they come out of that background and are basically feminists today. So uh, I think, particularly with the environmental crisis coming out very strong, that a lot of these countries that have not been fully integrated and are not modernized are facing a really grim future unless they can move into sort of an ecological, sustainable, agriculturally based economies uh, of eco-socialism. And I think that's possible. I just don't see the local progressive forces to move that forward in those countries. But I, I think the strategy exists. And then also, what about North Korea? Next question, you got it back The hypothesis I'm researching is that the there's covert, the CIA, these covert operations. Um, it's a very, you know, they control the, the propaganda. They could, there's, so when you talk about military, industrial, the deep state, this level of corruption, at, you know, um, I see it coming from the Zionist. It's a very war, you know, type of force. Unless we can deal with that kind of corruption, I think, you know, talking about socialistic ideas are not going to ever take hold. Yeah. Do you have a question? Well, it's more a comment. I'd like his response yeah. to that. Yeah, I think that is a great problem. You know, uh, there have been revolutions carried out through mass movements and disruptions, like the Iranian revolution that threw out the Shah. There really wasn't a armed revolution in the sense of the Bolshevik revolution or the Maoist revolution. Uh, in countries uh, where there's dictatorships, I, uh, you know, if they have need to take up arms to overthrow their oppressor, I have no problem with that. In America, I thought that was a road when I was in my 20s. I really don't longer believe that that's sort of possible in the, uh, looking at the state and how deeply rooted it is. So um, I think uh, it's unknowable until you produce really a massive social movements that are in their millions, and that are able to take over local governments, that are able to take over the federal government. And then uh, you have to see what happens from that point. Um, but it's, 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 it
very, it's very difficult yeah. question. Yes, sir. I came late, so you may have addressed this question before I got here, so I'm sorry. Um, in the last 20, 30 years, uh, we've seen uh, American workers, uh, middle class American workers, yeah. uh, what do you need, fear for living. I'm and sorry. indeed, what do you need, uh, honey? rights <laughs> as workers be eroded. Give me a minute. Uh, as the unions Give me a minute, themselves okay? have, in many cases, gone out of business. Um, this is crazy. What is necessary in order to revitalize the unions? in this country so that they could bring about the same kind of progress that was made in the 1930s and 40s when you had at one time uh, better than half of the American working uh, force uh, represented in some way by unions. Without unions, you know, everybody is, just about everybody is at the standard of living uh, that, you'd, uh, that you'd get at Walmart. And uh, that's one of the reasons I think that, you know, Trump touched, uh, hypocrite that he was, uh, Trump touched on uh, a real nerve here because a lot of people are very angry and don't know where to go. So the question is about how to revitalize uh, unions. Yes. Um, well, I think the Chicago Teachers Union is a great example of what a revitalized union needs to do. So there's a lot of talk about social unionism, that you not only have to represent your members, but you have to represent the class uh, and the community and build the relationship with, with them. Um, the second point is that we're not going to reproduce the 1930s. I thought we could. I, I always loved that old slogan, make every factory a fortress. Um, I worked at U.S. Steel. That fortress was torn down can't make a fortress out of U.S. Steel anymore because the damn mill ain't there. Uh, and the working class, as this discussion your questions before, has changed quite qualitatively in many ways. So I think the trade unions are still extremely important. They are actually the strongest institutional force that we still have, as weak as they are. But the social movements and the trade unions, and I think we could look at movements like in South Africa, and Brazil, and uh, El Salvador, and many other countries that you have seen a merger of both the social movements and the trade unions and broad united front type organizations and parties. That is really going to be the answer. Over here. Uh, I've been someplace that uh, uh, either Denmark or Sweden is experimenting with giving people an income or unemployed. Oh, yeah. And they're wanting to study how they spend the money and what they're doing, but it looks like what they're trying to do is address people who are unemployed. Yeah. The, uh, a basic living way or a basic income, a basic yes. annual income. Yeah. This idea was actually discussed when Nixon was president. And, uh, yeah, and actually the left came out against it at the time. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, and actually it was being seriously discussed because of all the, of the welfare rights for them was quite strong at the time. Uh, people demanded jobs instead. Uh, yeah, I think it's very interesting stuff. There's more experiment. I forget too whether it was Denmark or Sweden or uh, yeah, Norway perhaps. Uh, and it was, it's been raised like in the New York Times and columns and stuff. Um, so I think uh, I think that's one of the demands that uh, we, as a progressive movement, should seize upon and propagate. That uh, you, know, you don't need to work a 40-hour week anymore. Productivity has gone up, uh, but uh, of course, how has capital used the new technology to push people into temporary and part-time jobs? Uh, productivity is up with thousands, millions of less workers. The fact. Technology is more responsible for unemployment than outsourcing. About 80% of the jobs is estimated were lost in technology. Uh, so the fight in part is over technology, how to best use it. Let's use the technology to shorten the work week, employ more people, or produce a uh, annual income. Okay. Uh, all right. One We're more. going to be wrapping up here in a minute and going to uh, Cubs or Sox fans. Do you have a question over there? Yes. Um, 
What is the nuts and bolts okay. of converting yeah, from change, the economy we have now to a cooperative-based okay. county uh, economy? Okay. The cooperatives in the United States are, relatively speaking, small firms. Yeah. Uh, Gar Alpowitz's great on this, if you don't know Gar, he, he writes quite a lot on it. Now Gar's argument is a little broader than mine. He talks about uh, you know, cooperative credit unions that exist in many places and cooperative uh, uh, buyer like Costco, he includes all that. Um, I think uh, it needs to be taken up by the trade unions in part. The steel workers have actually worked with Mondragon in Spain to try to create some cooperatives here. In Canada, the trade unions have started to move on it. Uh, it would be great to start teaching in schools. I would ask my students, would you like to see cooperative ownership taught in the business department of Dubai? And then, oh yeah, why aren't they doing that? You know. So uh, I know it's a, I, once it gets out to people and you explain it. So I think that's the first, there has to be a lot of propagating of the idea. Uh, and I think Mondragon uh, has problems, but still is a great example. It's, like the fourth largest corporation in Spain. It's existed for many, many years, 80,000 workers. Um, so, and Venezuela, let me just say this too, Venezuela I think is a good example. Because Venezuela actually created schools for workers that trained them in how to run the cooperative. Uh, then students would go out and they would form a cooperative and they would be, go back to their communities and they would talk to their communities about what does the community want. Do you want health care? Do you want tourism? Do you want better transportation? Do you want a better sewer system? And based off of what the community said, they would form a cooperative to fill that need. And the government would loan them the money to start the business with low, they had to pay that money back, low, low interest loans, so they were needed to be based in the market, they needed to be successful, but it was subsidized through education and support from the government. Uh, and they created about 130,000 cooperatives. Uh, pretty good. Although, capitalists still have a chokehold on the major part of the economy. But I, I think, so there are interesting things going on. All right, let's give our speaker a big hand. During the rebuttal period. Cubs or Sox fan? <laughs> well, we're out of time, Charlie. No, they, we can't. You know, you can't drag on for another 15 or 20 minutes. No, I'm saying tuition. People haven't paid tuition. Okay. Everybody that hasn't paid tuition, raise your hand. Be honored. Yeah, I thought I got almost everybody. Yeah, I've been going around. Well, it's three thousand. You have your three dollars ready? Okay. Let how many people want to start rebuttals tonight? You can sit down, sir, and get a free meal. Yeah, you can sit down and eat while. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's have a show of hands and keep your hands up. We're going to count, and then that will be the number of rebuttals. No more. We're going to cut it off after the number is up and give our speaker the last word. And we drag on with the time every night. Okay, keep your hands up, everybody. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hey, Charlie, you going to give a rebuttal? Charlie! No, we You going to give a rebuttal or not? No. Okay. That's ten. Okay, we got ten about four minutes. Go with about four minutes. Four minutes. Andy, you're going to have to keep time. I will. All right. All right, ready? Go. All right. Thanks for the speaker. We have been desperately needing a good economic speaker for years and decades here. So he did a very nice job. Some of my formal training was uh, economics and finance at Wall Street. So I can speak to that a little bit. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay. Um, so thanks for being here. Um, it would probably be wise, you know, we need somebody like this to explain uh, 
Is it Mr. Harris? What's your name? Yeah, Terry yeah. Harris. Terry, we need someone like you to talk to the meat, our, uh, the media in Chicago. It's just awful. Yeah. Oh God, awful. <laughs> Nationally, it's awful. But we need someone like you to really explain things to our stupid reporters in this town. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, they're dumb. They don't know anything about economics. That's right. And finance. We need a guy like, like this with some information. But this is the kind of stuff that needs to get out there. So this is an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, my take on all this as far as transnationals and Wall Street and globalization and corporations is that they're just, uh, I don't know if you use this term, they're looking for the lowest possible denominator, um, of course. And they have been for decades. So. You know, they don't want unions. They're going to go run after cheap labor in another country. They don't want to be taxed. They're going to go to Bermuda, Cayman Islands, Bahamas, wherever the hell they can hide their money, and uh, they don't want to be taxed. They're always going to be rascals that run away from paying wages, paying living wages, and paying taxes. So, I like my question. Tim, sit down. He's a White Sox fan. Leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's your problem. You haven't said anything in three minutes up there. You're talking a lot like Trump. <laughs> I'm going to do my Sean Spicer. <laughs> Better watch out. You're in here. You already have that damn trainer from, from the Cubs of Mother St. Louis, Benedict Fowler. You're... Your apology is not accepted. <laughs> All right, enough Sean Spicer. Okay, so, um, yeah, it was very good, and uh, hopefully we can tax derivatives and tax uh, shelters and tax havens and international crooks and Wall Street uh, shenanigans where they can make a trillion trades per second, and funny money and goddamn service economy and all that garbage. Is this the service economy? Trading, making a tr trillion trades per second. I hate Wall Street. I hate, hate stockbrokers. They're all my customers. They don't even know how they got so rich. And you know what? I think it's more than 1.2 trillion that we printed for Wall Street. I've seen data where it's 12 trillion. And they only have to hold 10% in their reserves in banks. In stockbrokers. So they can, tri they can, they can, they can loan out 90% of that 12 trillion. Maybe I'll put the decimal point And they're too big to fail. How much time do I have? 50 seconds. 50 seconds? All right. I'll minutes or Who wants to see my Sean Spicer? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, this the word needs to get out. It's Economics is a tough subject. Uh, I didn't do too well in school, but I, I you know, understand the basics of it. And uh, economics kind of makes this world go around and... I don't even think Trump understands it well, but he knows how to work in, you know, casinos and hotels and play golf and all that silly stuff. So um, hopefully we can get some revenue and some income from taxing the uh, crooks on Wall Street. Thank you. Three points, if I can read my writing, and I can't see that well. But a lot of this stuff has a local component. Uh, uh, the LaSalle Street or Robin Hood or transaction tax is well known to Jane Adams Senior Caucus. We've advocated that for a long time. And yes, a lot of our representatives uh, say that it's dead on arrival. Well, uh, there's something called movement politics and they may be dead on arrival politically. Uh, second thing is uh, immigration. Immigration is uh, something that wasn't talked about much there, but it's certainly uh, an important element. And Jane Adams Senior Caucus is considering having an immigration uh, uh, section or committee uh, we have one of our organizers married to a undocumented uh, person and uh, a lot of our concern is that uh, the current administration, federal administration, wants to deport a bunch of people that we let in and are cutting our grass. 
<laughs> we let them in to cut our grass, and now we want to cut them out, kick them out. I don't know about that. The third thing is unions. Okay, the unions, uh, in the past, uh, the unions sometimes have seen themselves as the economic sector. They, uh, they got pinstripe suits, and they're arguing with corporation heads yeah. that also have pinstripe suits. Uh, we look at it just the opposite. Yesterday I was at a, uh, a action at Jarvis and Sheridan. Jarvis and Sheridan. We heard from AFSCME, we heard from SEIU, and we heard from the community. Jane Adams Trini, Jane Adams Senior Pocket, One North Side, and other community groups. Unions have to see themselves as part of the community rather than the economic sector. Thank you. Next. Next. People wonder why the Soviet bloc failed. Well, they had their revolution, as everybody knows, in 1917. And at that particular time, Germany was the leading industrial power in Europe. And Lenin thought that Germany would have a revolution so it could give Russia the base to develop socialism. Because if you want to develop socialism, you have to have a highly developed industrial base, which Russia never had. It was the weak link in the chain of all of Europe. It was the poorest country in all of Europe. Basically, that's why it failed. Another reason is the United States had something like 250 bases surrounding the Soviet Union. So it had to build up a base of industrial base and also had to develop munitions and armaments in order to succeed. And that's a hard thing to overcome because if you got those two things lacking, you can't feed the people, you can't give them clothing or have the necessities of life. China, at a certain point, recognized this after the Soviet failure. And it, it had to have an economic base, so it developed a hybrid economy, which is part socialist and part capitalist. And the capitalist would lend itself to the development of the economic base so China could go into socialism. That's what you have in China now. There's several countries that are still on that path where the Communist Party is backing this type of hybrid economy. And there's places, like I said, North Korea, Vietnam, and Cuba. Probably Cuba is the most socialistic of all, all those uh, com in coming economy, uh, colonies economies, but it doesn't have the base to develop a strong economic base that's too small. But it has certain things, like it developed its, uh, its pharmaceutical industry, which is very good, one of the best things in Cuba. Also, people, you have two types of people in Cuba, some that want to run away to the United States and get rich, and some that feel that the society is pretty good if it only could get more food in there. Of course, now you have a recognition of Cuba by the United States. Whether this new government keeps it up or not, the Trump government, nobody knows. But what's happening is they have a lot of tourists coming there. And that's one of the basic industries, is tourists and this type of industry. So it's going along, but still there's a question mark. It could, if it could develop into a socialist state. In China, for instance, you have the most developed solar panel development in the world, 
because it, it, does, it doesn't have capital there to invest in the coal production and things of that nature, which is dying out. So it's allowing itself to develop through, through the solar industry. All right. Okay, bye. Uh, Bernie Sanders' 12-point plan reads as follows. Invest in our crumbling infrastructure. Transform energy systems. Develop new economic models. Make it easier for workers to join unions. Raise the federal minimum wage. Provide equal pay for women workers. Reform trade policies. Make college affordable. Break up the big banks. Uh, join the rest of the industrialized world. Have a universal health care system, Medicare for all. Expand Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, nutrition programs, and reform the tax code. That's a 12-point plan for the 2016 Sanders campaign. Uh, the majority of people in this country uh, at least on the polls, want that to be the policy platform of our federal government of highest levels of uh, power in the White House. So why isn't that the way it is? Well, it's because the 1% are an endgame strategy and they think it's the end of history. Uh, they can make money off just having money. They don't have to work. You don't have to show up to any job or clock in to any time clock. After returning from his Hajj in Mecca on May 21st, 1964, at an airport press conference in New York, uh, El Hajj Malik Al Shabazz, more famously known as Malcolm X, made a brilliant statement on the history of white supremacy in the world. He said this Can you imagine what can happen, what would certainly happen, if all these African heritage peoples ever realize their blood bonds, if they ever realize that they all have a common goal, if they ever unite. Now what if Malcolm's exact analysis was applied to we the peoples of working classes and middle classes of all races, ethnicities, beliefs, ideologies, and creeds, in our global struggle to liberate from the dominant system of economic oppression? It might be something that sounds similar to this. Can we all imagine what can happen, what would certainly happen if all of us working peoples ever realize our class bonds, if we ever realize we all have a common goal, if we ever mass mobilize peacefully and democratically for a global general strike. A true We the People evolution is an event which in the hearts and minds of working class communities and middle class communities is long overdue. This is something from what Slim Brundage wrote and for those of you who don't know, he's the founder of the college. Uh, the greatest fight for free speech in the history of the United States was that of the Wobblies in the 1910s and the early 1920s. Uh, their free speech fights are an epic in American culture. Up and down the Pacific Coast states, the IWW was agitating for one big union. As word went out, Wobblies would rally at the town where the fight centered, as fast as one soapboxer was dragged off to jail, another would mount the box and continue to fight. They filled the jails, but they won clean bunkhouses and decent food for that on in all the logging camps. I guess uh, this is for Malcolm and for Slim. What they really should type on those now hiring signs is we make so much off of wage slavery, there's no end in sight. What you really should hype up those nickel and dimes is now there's no such thing as liberty because cartels rule our lives. What they really should write on those four rent signs is we've warred and bled our souls to their end for what price. What you really should light up those for sale signs is we've corporated ourselves to near death this time. We the people have the scars to prove it and that's why we are unstoppable movements. Thank you very much to the speaker this evening. Great, great. Over the last 50 years, uh, working conditions have changed a lot. Our lives have changed a lot, lot for the better. 
and nobody can deny it. The assembly line worker of 1970 is no longer there. Working condition has improved a lot, and technology has helped there. So that is reality. So we don't have a union because we do not have union jobs, which used to be there. Having said that, I'm going to say a few things about that. The Trump administration is on the verge of changing on several issues. And in China, they are going to change substantially and substantially reduce passing China. But the globalization, they are going to back up, back up and uh, accept it. On immigration thing, oh, they will be still doing it because there is lots of demand in our, in our huge waters. But it will be done a little bit more quietly. I, do, I, I think it, you gave a great speech, and uh, I think it was the most informative speech in a long, long time. And I learned a lot, and uh, I think everybody learned a lot. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, it's there. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I just uh, confused, okay? Uh, I, I do not know that much about economics, so I'm going to say some of the issues which, uh, which I think are important in a society, and that can help us. Number is the body. Oh, thank you, sir. I think, I think uh, the body driving poverty is a child is being born, and nobody financially or guidance-wise responsible for that child. Even, even under, the, under the better economic conditions people, Children are not raised properly, they are not taken care of properly, they do not have proper guidance, and parents of our, of our parents or grandparents do not know how to how to take care of them. So that thing we have to take, we have to have more social discussion about that, and either we have it or we don't have it. Okay. But birth should never occur without somebody being responsible for it. Second is death. I think first time uh, in a uh, history in our country. There are more suicides than homicides. So, so yeah. things have changed. We, we, people are, people are taking their own lives and are not being killed. So, so, so that, that, that is a very important change. And I think lots of people will like to die, die peacefully, quietly, and just so that opportunity. And that will improve the society a lot because we will not have so much mental problems and all those things. Criminals. Criminals are the biggest single worry in American society, either going out at night or going in a subway or somewhere. Or any that there are always there are people, bad people. We have to take care of them, we have to take our sleep. If we cannot fix them, then as I, I told I told before, just send them to Ireland and hey, happy, happy life. <laughs> education. Education is, is in a mess. And a simple reason, education can be fixed with a lower cost. What we, are, what we are missing is that we are putting them through an assembly line and so go step by step by step by step and a car will come out. It is not like that. It is a mental thing. If you get enough knowledge to move to next grade, you move. You don't have to wait for a whole year. If you do not have a capital, if you do not have a, you are behind and you want to go, try to give me extra help uh, and see what the what best we can do. But, but we cannot have a, this kind of thing which costs Fifteen thousand dollars a year for a kid who doesn't learn anything in one year. You know, I I, I have had a college graduate who cannot close cash register in a less than twenty minutes for a small stroke. They take one hour. I say, what's going on? And that is not going to work. Lots of people do not know what bank account is. Lot lot lots of kids come out. I'm done. Yeah. I'm sorry. sorry. Thank you. Okay, let me go Hi, I'm Ellen Corley. This is my third time here, and uh, thank you for the great talk. I, uh, I, my point is, I think that I, that what he, we need is a more revolutionary kind of approach to education, where. We're doing this all the time. This is what yes. education is, right? If John Dewey said it, he came out of Chicago. He said, you know, Jane Addams settlement was what he was talking about. We need free speech, people talking, you know, different languages, backgrounds, 
you know, this is a melting pot of ideas. And I, what we need is, the problem is, like it was in Jane Addams and John Dewey's time, the power, you know, John Power, capitalism, corruption, you know, they, uh, I'm really concerned about it, uh, as we all are. I see in Trump, you know, the deep state fascist control of the media, of our thoughts, uh, you know, like taking over the environment. Uh, it is, it is counter-revolutionary. It is counter-people. I mean, it is genocide, you know, it is really evil. And yet, because we don't even see it, we, it's not talked about in the media because they censor it, you know, we, we are uh, just getting stupided down. And uh, I, that's my, I've always, my mentor said Jesus was a skeptical anarchist. And I, you know, I'm like, well, wasn't he a socialist, you know, or a, but I now see why, because we have to be skeptical anarchists. We gotta be somewhat revolutionary in a nonviolent way. We have to be, you know, teaching and ordering ourselves to be innovative. You know, that's, that's where it requires a kind of a freedom, which I think we're getting. You see it in the 40, under 40 people. But as Bill Ayer said, follow these Black Lives Matter, support them, get behind them, you know, um, do what they're doing. I try to go out there and march. I feel like Forrest Gump when I'm out there, but it, you know, that's why I'm here, you know, and I, I'm actually trying to get up the nerve to run against my hated Rahm Emanuel, you know, because I think if I learn as a female, you know, get some feminist therapy and learn to, to not be afraid of confronting, um, you know, truth and uh, corruption, I, I think 99.9% .9 of the people will be behind me. And the secret is not taking any money. You know, we, uh, that, we just have to get it out of there. That Citizens United is going to kill us. So if we just train everybody to run, you know, and all sue them at the same time, maybe yeah. we'll have a chance. Oh. <laughs> what are you going to run for? Thanks for your very informative talk. I enjoyed it. Um, you mentioned uh, democracy a couple times and how uh, you contrasted representative uh, democracy and uh, participatory democracy. I would go much farther. Uh, we don't have a, a democracy of any kind whatsoever uh, in this country and in most of the world. What we have is oligarchy, and that's the prevailing sort of system of government uh, in the entire world and all of the West. We have oligarchies. Um, you mentioned, you said something about democratizing the economy. If we had a democracy, we wouldn't have to de democratize either the economy or any other area of life. There are a lot of issues in many areas of life. Uh, there are social issues, of course, that, you know, hot button issues. There's the environment, there's foreign policies. Uh, if we had a democracy, people would control all Americans, democratically, would control all of those things. And so one problem that I always have with socialists, even though I agree with most of what they always what they say, is that they're fixated on the economy, the economy, the economy. Marx went off on the wrong tangent from the very beginning, uh, where he said the economy, uh, economics was the superstructure, I believe, or the substructure, one or the other, but this, the economy was on top, the, the, the main thing, and politics was just the, the peripheral thing. He had it completely wrong. Uh, we have people in power who control everything. Uh, and, and one of their tools, in fact, their major tool, is the government itself. Our legislatures, our, our, our presidents and governors and all of those people. They are their servants. Those people are the servants of the oligarchy, the, the, ruling, the ruling elite. So we have to attack the, the whole structure, which is the U.S. Constitution itself. And we, so we have to absolutely just get rid of the U.S. Constitution and replace it with what you mentioned, uh, participatory democracy. But it wouldn't just be about workers. It wouldn't just be about worker control here or there. Okay? It would be an entire system of assemblies of people uh, getting together and making decisions on everything in a coordinated uh, fashion. Um, that's mostly what I had to say. Thank you. To quote one of our best-known economists of the 20th century, 
You're all a bunch of socialists. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The American businessman and business owner is probably one of the most maligned individuals in the world. Not enough. I know several personally. They do things like make payroll. They pay taxes. They support the local infrastructure. And they're trying their damn best to survive in a global economy where their competition is not the gentleman next door, but the gentleman from China. Globalization has made the world increasingly competitive. As Thomas Friedman says, we're speeding up. We're also starting to get a lot faster in the way we do things. Climate's also changing quite a bit. And one of the benefits of globalization is that the rest of the world is finally beginning to develop. What many of you may not realize is that in the last 20 years or so, a number of markets have developed. The China-India phenomenon, for example, has brought a living standards up in India, in China, and many of the other developing countries, stuff that we don't see. I personally think that the best way to create jobs the best way to bring taxes in is with a globally integrated economy. I know our speaker said about maybe fractions of a decimal cent on margins to make money through algorithmic trades. That stabilizes the world currency in a lot of ways because you don't have these large, gigantic, fluctuating exchange rates like you used to. It may be fractions of a cent, but it does mean that it doesn't flow by dollars. What is needed today is that we all have to be a little smarter, we all have to work a little harder, and we all have to get a little better at what we do in order to stay employed. Yes, we have a gig economy. Yes, our world has changed. But one thing our speaker also forgot to mention after World War II is that there was so much vast destruction around the world, the United States was the only game in town. We had what we call the 30 years of dominance. Now, about Trump and us, if we start this nationalization, this trade war, so to speak, you'd think the world would be a bad place now. Wait until we start disengaging from the world. Because if we do, guess who steps into our place? China. I'm sure our economist is familiar with the uh, one belt, one road policy of China, correct? And that they're right now that about maybe a year or two ago that a little bit of a miracle happened from laptops being shipped from Shenzhen to Spain. They were put in a rail car and in less than a week the goods arrived. Now, I am all for globalization. There will be those that will not be able to adapt. Therefore, my own views on this is that we need to support globalization. We need to support, you know, the benefits of free trade. But we also need to widen our safety nets a little bit more. We may also need to do things like increase our taxes on everybody a little bit more, maybe those at the top and at the bottom. If we want the benefits that some of these European countries have as far as free health care, free dental care, it's going to require about a 50% tax rate at the federal level and maybe about a 10 to 15% rate at the local level, which we only leave us about maybe 40% of the wages that we make. It's not a matter of, is capitalism better or not. It's a matter of what do we want from our government and are we willing to pay for it and how much are we willing to pay. Thank you. Did you say 50% tax rate? That's right. Come on. <laughs> uh, do you see that tripod there? It has three legs. Picture, if you will, a society, a functioning society, one leg is government, one leg is business, 
a third leg is or should be organized labor. When those three legs are able to function at an equal level that they all uh, respect one another, then you have a society that's in a position to do things. Until that time, you are going to have unnecessary class wars. You're going to have uh, feelings that you've got to get all of your ideas from guys like Marx and Engels, any place but the United States. <laughs> when in fact, we have been some of the greatest yes. social and economic innovators of the last two or three hundred years. Yes. Countries throughout the world yes. envy what we can do when we have our act together. We have gone through a slump, as they say in organized baseball. Yes. We don't know what direction we are going in or where we want to go. It could be argued that Donald Trump was elected not by people who were voting for Donald Trump, but by people who were voting against the status quo. It wasn't just the poor and the desperate who were voting for Donald Trump. It was the middle class who thought that they were about to have the rug pulled out from under them. We have got to, I mean, we can sit here and talk about a utopian society all we like. We live in a real world. We have got to realize that, yes, workers need security. On the other hand, and there are a few people here who would probably, if they were carrying firearms, be glad to pull them out at this point. Uh, uh, I won't say whether or not I'm wearing a bulletproof vest. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, capital has to be able to function in a situation without fear, where they don't feel that all of their assets are one day going to be confiscated by a regime uh, which is doing it, quote, in the name of the people. Right. Um, you can't have a society operating in a state of fear and uncertainty. Now, I'm not even going to comment much about Donald Trump. I am going to say that a society which uh, lives in a situation where it does not know what its government is going to do next, where it does not have, you know, it used to be do you remember the expression, sound as a dollar? It used to be that the American dollar, the American government, even the American post office, were considered things you could count on. Remember, uh, neither rain nor snow nor sleet shall deter these postmen on their appointed rounds. You wouldn't say that today, because any day now, I expect to get my great-grandfather's no. Civil War draft no. notice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, only half, I'm only half kidding. We read all the time about people who get letters in the mail that were mailed 50 years ago. We have got to, if we're going to be a functioning society, we have got to get our act together, learn to operate in a common sense fashion, put politics and ideology aside, and be concerned about how are we going to get these widgets produced, how are we going to get them delivered to our markets, how are we going to make our streets safe so that people are not afraid to go to and from work even in the wee hours of the morning. These are the practical issues that our politicians in many cases love to avoid. Why can they do this? They can do this because of the fact that it is at this point so damned expensive to run for public office. We are, according to some estimates, the most expensive place in the world to run for public office. When I was over in Ireland about five years ago, I uh, had an opportunity to meet a couple uh, members of the Doyle, the Irish Parliament, <clears throat> and we talked for about five hours, and one of them said, you know, you got some pretty good ideas, Butler. Why don't you run for something over there, like maybe Congress? And I said, gentlemen, I can't. You guys have... Uh, uh, campaigns that last maybe a month and a half and cost maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars If an American wants to run for Congress, he'd better have a million and a half dollars in his war chest 
at about the time that he's talking seriously about running for Congress. Wow. This is the reality. Consequently, you get, I know I'll be soon in a minute, uh, you get people who can only afford to be in Congress because someone else is bankrolling them. If you want democracy, you got to begin democracy by having it reachable by the people uh, that it's supposed to protect and represent. Right. Thank you very yeah. much. Good evening. <clears throat> Jerry's still here. Uh, Jerry not only talks the talk, but he walks the walk. I was at a protest in D.C. <coughs> right after the WTO protest in Seattle, ran into Jerry. And our march was going, I don't know where. I'd lived in D.C. for five years, and I knew uh, where everything was. We were suddenly marching away from all the important parts, the Capitol, the White House, and all that. So uh, I think the police had gotten somebody in there and said, follow me. And, you know, and that's what you do. Anyway, Jerry Jerry says, for a long time, I'm going to go eat. And uh, I said, well, I do too. I'm really hungry, but I'm curious as to where we're going. The flame, Jerry went off the sun to go eat. And I said, well, I'm going to. I'm going to go where Jerry goes. I'm cutting through the crowd. All of a sudden, the police cut, cut in half right behind me and arrested everybody behind me. So, if I hadn't followed Jerry, I would have been arrested. So, anyway, the moral is follow Jerry. My, uh, my specialty, uh, my thesis is on propaganda. Modern propaganda was perfected in the United States especially by the pub, uh, Committee on Public Information for World War I. And we have the best propaganda in the world. The, uh, we have what I call the five F words. Identification, friend or foe, and fight, flight, or freeze. These uh, words are under the command of the amygdala. The amygdala is this tiny little almond-sized brain we have that we inherited from our reptile ancestors a million years ago. Now, all they have to do is to get that amygdala in control. And then we don't think rationally after that. The way you do that is you tell the people there's an alien, foreign threat to you. Then you tell them they're subversive in their midst. That's all it takes. 9-11. We saw the uh, foreign aliens attack us. A few days later, anthrax from the inside. The perfect formula for uh, taking control. We all, we all went into a state of fear. We said, <clears throat> take away our rights, pass that Patriot Act. We don't care, just keep us safe. You know, and, uh, so that's all you need to uh, control people. Anyway, fight or flight. That comes out of, of course, that, that's an amygdala command, an amygdala instinct, and then fight, flight, or uh, or freeze. And so once we become uh, fully afraid, that's what we'll do. And we'll do whatever the, we, we, we want to form into a, like a beehive or an anthill at that point. We want one leader, we'll follow them, we'll sacrifice, whatever. So and this is exactly what Hitler did. He said England and uh, Poland were going to attack them. They had the Reichstag fire inside by the communists, and all the Germans just followed them. So, and the formula still works today. You see it now. So, uh, we have to overcome this. I know Jerry and all of us are, have tried many times, thought from every direction. How are we going to change things so they're actually democratic in this country? The first Gulf War, 92% of Americans supported that. They believed that tiny little Iraq, the size of California, was going to attack us. And Nurse Nayira, she's the one who got up before Congress and said, oh, they got babies and they put them off the incubators and they slammed them on the floor and killed them. Nurse Nair was not even in Iraq. Mm -hmm. She was the daughter of uh, the ambassador of the United States. That whole thing was fabricated. They, they tell lie after lie. We fall for it. A few later, years later, 
more life in my we fall for it. When are we going to catch on? The um, the anti-war protests, the hard hats, the workers, the laborers, were against the protesters, and so we're easy, we're easily uh, divided. So we just have to intellectually overcome this first before we're going to be able to uh, change things. All right. Uh, once again, let's thank our speaker for a very, very, very nice lecture. We'd like to have you back again sometime. I'll be very quick. And eclectic here. Uh, it's been covered a lot of it. The uh, the economic business, uh, capitalist, fascist. Uh, are operating on a global scale. Uh, they are functioning uh, fully in compliance, and just like you had on it, uh, with their partners right now, the government. And they're benefiting uh, the world, yeah, any, anybody, anybody <laughs> thinks this nationalism, uh, the current administration, if you follow it, I don't know if you guys do this, has been slowly cutting away through executive orders the, the little few labor laws, believe you me, I have lectures on this, very few labor laws in the United States that we do have, they are eliminating, slowly but surely. This, this administration is not friendly to the House of Labor. It is not. Um, yes, organized labor has a difficult time. Uh, we're going to accomplish all of this in, in terms of terminating international trade. This notion that we're going to become a nationalist company that's been hit on here. Finally, I have to agree with Tim on this. Yes, they're just going to take it over from the outside. Uh, last of all, though, I got to say this here. I heard this from the guy over here. Has that, and he says the union officials, oh, yeah, wearing a, a blue pinstripe suit. But I hate to tell you, I've been a union official for a number of years, and I own a blue pinstripe suit. Good. <laughs> we knew it. And I wear it very proudly when I go into contract negotiations for an arbitration hearing. Also on my desk, sir, I have a copy of this movie called Teamster Boss. <laughs> now, if your job is on the line and you're getting your ass kicked out, who would you rather come see, the Teamster Boss? For some of your pals over there, let me tell you, this is the organized labor movement has matured, and I applaud that, that it's embraced professionalism. Legal labor law has not gotten simpler, it has gotten more complex. This is not the 19th century. You do not have the union, it has gotten very litigious. I go up against sometimes three lawyers the corporations will send up. That's a fact of life. That's nothing we can control. Uh, every human resource officer of corporations is an attorney. That's the fact of life. I, there's been a lot of talk about getting away from it. I don't know if that's going to happen, but that's a whole other topic. Anyhow, thanks a lot, Jerry. Mr. Ruff, that was very good. And I appreciate your coming. Please come again. It's all yours, Andy. Yeah. yeah I'm going to throw out my three piece suit. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> like hell, I will. I'm not really yeah. with that. I got to just like some kind of bomb. down here. Yeah, I got a little job like a worker. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I'll put Harley, on the why don't you bring him here next week? Yeah, we're over a little. Hey, we're in here sometime. Thank you to our speaker who gave a, a wide ranging talk. Uh, once again, it's like they said trying to cram 50 pounds of potatoes into a 20 pound sack. Yeah, there's, you run out of time. You could talk for hours on any one of those six or eight big topics you talked about. I'll just leave you with three thoughts. There's an old Indian saying when you're riding a dead horse, you have to get up and change horses. <laughs> Many people in America have, uh, they've been writing psychological beliefs, beliefs on certain things that have been dead for several years now. They have no basis in reality. They're living in a mythological bubble. Albert Einstein said, the human race is in a race between education and extinction. And I'm not sure which side is winning. Extinction. That's Albert. Um, 
the best website I know of to get daily news that matters is uh, Bill Moyers and hundreds of other people have commented. They, they, they look to that for news every day. It's called Common Dreams. And they have an assortment of writers that uh, write uh, things just like what we heard tonight. They summarize in two or three pages uh, what's going on in America. Uh, the last thing is, is Professor Griffin said out of California in his first book out of ten on the subject of 9-11 and the forensic evidence. He said, you don't need a college degree and an open mind to understand this. You need a 30% open mind and a seventh grade education. Just open your mind 30%, step through the psychological barrier and begin to look at the forensic evidence and it's something that a seventh grader can understand. We've lived with the myth of 9-11 way too long, and that is what's enabling 98% of the bad things that are happening in America in these programs, and Trump is a, a result of the crisis of 9-11. It's allowed them, the rich billionaires, to push our country in a direction toward becoming a police state. And as Charlie said, uh, the middle class workers, everybody, is they're under attack. So that's it. Uh, we need uh, people need to wake up and start looking at uh, things that are happening. All right. Okay. All right. Our speaker gets the last word. Come on speaker up. Speaker gets the last word. Okay. <laughs> Don't forget to give us your website and to plug your book. So we can get the last word. Right here. Oh, one sec. They expect us to be out of here by quarter to nine, so it's we got about minutes. nine minutes. So start gathering your stuff and begin to move to the back in about five minutes, so they can clean the tables. Don't Thank forget you. to plug Thank your you book and give us your up. website. Yeah, well, it's just last word. It's the last word. I mean, I, I have a good forty minutes laid out my argument, so uh, I'm not going to hang you all up and try to reply to everybody. Uh, I have books here in the back. Uh, if you buy it at Amazon, it's 24 plus another four bucks to ship it, but I give it to you for 20. Uh, so I hope you uh, are interested to read the full arguments and other information that we didn't even get to tonight. I really appreciated coming here. I enjoyed everything. So uh, I wish you uh, a good night. Thank you. Gavel us out. Let us dismiss us, Andy. Yep. Okay, I'll get out of the line of sight of the camera there. I'll, uh, that's it for all uh, the College of Complexes on April 8th. Good. April 8th, 1917. 2017. Day's the 8th. Day's the 8th. So, well, if you, this was a good date. So, uh, thank you all for coming, and we're gaveled out. We will see you next week. Thank you.